join me in prayer. Father, we stand astounded in so many ways because we have received from you such lavish love. We have received from you the forgiveness of sins not on merits we have earned, not because we have somehow performed well enough, but we have received grace. Lord, grace doesn't make any sense. Grace is by definition unfair. And yet you delight to pour out your grace upon us. Father, thank you for the amazing love with which you have loved us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has come, become like us so that he might die for us. Father, thank you that he has conquered death and gives life, abundant life to all who turn to him in Father, thank you for the privilege of lifting our voices to sing. Father, we pray that this day you would be with uh, our members who have gone to serve on this missions project. I pray that you would be with the youth, that you would give them endurance and boldness and strength. Lord, that you would work in them during these days as much as you work through them for the health and the good of the people there at Northside. Father, we lift up TJ that you would help him to lead well with wisdom and compassion and grace. Father, we pray that you would work here in our congregation. Lord, through our service on this community, Lord, would it work for eternal fruit? Lord, we know the sidewalks are going to become stained again. We know the mulch is going to need to be redone. We know the trees will need to be trimmed again. But Lord, would these efforts, these physical ways of loving the community, would it result in life change, in gospel conversations, and opportunities for people to be drawn to you to saving faith through our words and the good news that Jesus Christ has died and risen? Father, I pray that you would be glorified here in the worship of your people. Lord, as we turn our time to worship through the preaching of your word, Holy Spirit, would you enliven your book to us? Would you speak louder than I can speak? Would you touch our hearts and our minds? Would you move our will and our affections that we would look more like Jesus because of today? Lord, thank you for the assured hope, your promise that you are with us and one day you will bring us home to be with you forever. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, our children ages 5, 6, 7, and 8 are going to be headed to Children's Church, and they will have the joy of hearing the words of the Bible proclaimed to them in a, a way that is geared for their age, and we have the opportunity to open the Bible here together uh, as well. So if you have a Bible, let me encourage you to either turn that on or open that up to Luke chapter 10. We will be in verses 25 through 37 today. I find it fascinating in our culture, so much of Western culture has the underpinnings and even the lingo of the Bible. So much of our society has words and statements and phrases and ideas that come from the Bible that often we don't even realize that's where it finds its origins. 
for example, you look at uh, ambulances and rescues that are moving around town, and what is the symbol that you see? What is the emblem that's on the shoulder or on the, perhaps the, the chest piece? It, it's, it's a six-sided cross with a post in the middle that has a snake wrapped around it. How in the world did that come to be rescued? How did that come to be, here comes the, 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 the primary medics who are going to help restore your health? Well, it's a biblical image. It comes out of the book of Numbers. It comes when there were fiery serpents sent in among the people, and Moses was told to make a bronze serpent, put it on a post, and anybody who looked to the bronze serpent after they had been bitten would be healed. Hence, those who bring healing and rescue today are looking to the serpent on the post to find healing. It's a biblical image. Another concept that is pervasive in our culture is the Good Samaritan. For fun, yesterday I did a quick news search and looked up headlines that entailed Good Samaritan. And just in the last week, Good Samaritan pulls four from water. Good Samaritan struck and killed by, while helping stranded driver. Good Samaritan finds and returns bag of cash. Good Samaritan beaten after trying to help woman whose boyfriend slapped her. Good Samaritan rescues lost dog from San Juan Mountains. Good Samaritan helps stab, stabbing victim. Police seek Good Samaritan who helped in car fire rescue. We understand this idea of Good Samaritan. This is a, a concept we're fairly familiar with, right? It's something we're not surprised when we hear the term and just about any one of your neighbors were you to say, oh, there's a Good Samaritan, they would have some picture of what you're talking about. In fact, in our culture, the idea of a Good Samaritan is probably one of the best-known New Testament stories that we have. But there's a danger when something is that widely known. And that danger comes down to this. There's a danger. We're so familiar with the term Good Samaritan that we don't understand Jesus' point in the story. As I mentioned, we're back in Luke chapter 10 looking at this well-known Bible story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. We saw back in chapter 9 that a massive change in the life and ministry of Jesus took place. He has turned his face to go to Jerusalem. This is shortly after Peter makes the grand confession that Jesus is the Christ of God. And when Jesus makes that confession, everything turns. Jesus suddenly says, guess what? I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. Guess what? You guys, if you're going to follow me, you need to pick up your cross and come. Everything starts to turn. In fact, the tension in the story starts to mount. And this is where we find ourselves. Jesus, his face set towards Jerusalem. And now the rest of the chapters will be marked by growing conflict, by growing tension between Jesus and the religious establishment. Here's the setting for this well-known parable. If you have your Bible, let me encourage you to follow along as I read aloud Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Hear the word. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, that is Jesus, said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, that is the man, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest 
was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. The main point, the question that I think Jesus is setting before us is what is good neighboring? What is good neighboring? Yes, I made it into a verb. As I mentioned, this is a familiar parable. Most of you, upon hearing me read that parable, like, oh yeah, I've heard that somewhere. I know that story. It's a parable from the lips of Jesus. Jesus often taught in parables. And parable, it's a designed mechanism that Jesus would use to teach. It's telling a story. It's telling a story in order to teach a point. I've heard it said this way, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus often taught in parables in order to teach his disciples, but he was also doing something else in parables. Earlier in Luke chapter 8, Jesus said this, when his disciples asked him what a parable meant, he said to them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Jesus teaches in parables so his disciples will see and understand, and others will enjoy a fun story, but not necessarily understand its deeper meaning. This parable is one of the most widely known and widely recounted stories of all of Jesus' teachings. That doesn't mean it's one of the best understood. Jesus lays out the setting of this parable. The story that he tells begins in verse 30 where he says, He he replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. That's the setting of the parable. A man going down from Jerusalem went to Jericho. Now, all roads went down from Jerusalem. If you were to put it on, on a map, you're going essentially west to east, roughly a little bit to the north. And this is a drop in elevation over 17 miles of about 4,000 feet. So it was going down quite a bit as it went down through the hills. And this particular road has been known for thousands of years to be treacherous, fraught with dangers, not only because of the rough terrain and the chasms that lay along the side of the road, but also because of the prolific violence that is known on that stretch of road. Even today... That stretch of road goes from Israeli territory to Palestinian territory, and there is great conflict and big, massive signs that say, warning, if you're in the wrong place, you might die. So Jesus telling this parable about someone getting attacked along this stretch of road, it would not have been something far-fetched. It would have been something that anybody who lived in that region would be like, yeah, we've known that to happen. But Jesus tells us little to nothing else about this man. We don't get any backstory. We don't know his name. We don't know where he's from. We don't know why he was in Jerusalem or why he was going to Jericho. We don't know where, where else he might be traveling after Jericho. We don't know what he's carrying. We don't know anything about this man. All we know is that on this road from Jerusalem to Jericho, He gets mugged. He gets taken, attacked, beaten. Everything else that he has is gone. He's stripped and left for dead on the side of the road. 
Luke, being a physician, uses the term he's half dead, which not exactly sure how you define half dead. Maybe some of our medical professionals could help, you know, clue us in to what half dead really means and looks like, but his situation is dire. He's in a desperate situation. While much traffic today is on that stretch of road, their housing developments almost end to end in that region. This, in this day, was a deserted stretch where some travelers would pass on occasion. There was no regular roadside help. There was no 911 call box every half mile that you could reach. There were no regular patrols to help a stranded motorist or traveler who might be broken down on the side. This man's situation was dire and desperate. Without help, he would soon die. Then Jesus, as he so often does, spins the story from what we would expect. He takes the parable on a surprising turn. Look at verses 31 and 32. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road. And he saw him, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, passed by on the other side. Jesus introduces two characters. Again, we don't get names, but this is a parable. Jesus is telling us and painting the picture. He gives us what we need to know. These are two characters, a priest and a Levite, both of whom you would presume these are the good guys. These are the ones, if anybody's going to help, this is who ought to help. The priest was one who served in the temple, offering sacrifices on behalf of the people. He had responsibilities also in the local synagogues for teaching the people the law of God. If anyone had a priority to know the value of a human life that was perishing, the priest ought to be the one. But the language, as Jesus conveys it, he saw the man, and he uses this compound word that means he went as far away as he could possibly on the road without falling off to get around. The Levite, similarly. The man still there, unconscious, bleeding, dying on the road. The Levite comes up. The Levite, if you put it in a bracket, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. In order to be a priest, you had to be in the house of Aaron. Aaron was a member of the tribe of Levi. So the Levites, while they were not priests themselves, they were also well-versed in the law. They served to support the work of the priests. They were well-respected in the community. These were people who knew what God had declared. But nonetheless, this man, with great expectation that certainly he would stop, the same term is used. As far around as he could go without falling off the side of the road, he passes the man on the other side. In the context of this story, which we'll explore later in just a few minutes, Jesus is talking specifically to a man who is an expert in the law. I don't know if you recognize that. He's an expert in law. That's the person to whom Jesus is talking. And so when you bring up a priest and a Levite, these also are people who are well-versed in the law. And so this would have had a little bit of a stinging point to it in the communication of Jesus. Now much has been made and speculated. Well, why did they pass him by? The speculations run the gamut. Some cite, well, there's an Old Testament prohibition that a priest cannot touch a dead body, cannot be in contact with a dead body without going through about a week's long uh, ritual ceremonial process in order to become uh, ceremonially clean to go back to his priestly work. So he, of course, if the man was going to die while he was helping him pick him up, then he would would put himself in a whole lot of trouble. Others say it was more of a sinister disdain for common people they were just in too much of a hurry. They had their own business to attend to and couldn't be slowed down by this man in need. Maybe they just assumed that he was already too far gone or they looked around and said, this is actually a really dangerous spot. I don't want to get hurt too. Let me just run by. Here's the thing. 
why they went around misses the point. Because if Jesus wanted us to know why they went around, he would have told us. Jesus' point is that the most expected to render help, to be a good neighbor, failed miserably. And here's where Jesus masterfully, as he tells this story, brings it to its shocking climax. Look at verses 33 and 30 through 35. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and saw him, and he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. In order to understand how shocking this is, we have to understand the dynamics of Jews and Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans were like oil and water. They did not mix. They did not like each other. They didn't want to be close to each other, even though proximity-wise, they only lived a few miles away from each other. Going way back to when the nation of Israel divided itself right after Solomon, and you had the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, there became bad blood between these two groups. This is amplified during the Syrian and Babylonian captivities when the remnant of the people left in that region of Samaria intermarried with other refugees during that time and went away from the faithful worship of God. This led to a massive rift. Samaritans created their own mountain on which to worship, no longer in Jerusalem. They created their own system of worshiping, which, which merged the, the worship of the surrounding region with the worship as recorded in the book of Moses. And so this, this syncretized religion combined with their, their um, intermarriage with people in the surrounding area, the Jews looked at them and saw them as half-breed heretics. And the Samaritans in turn hated them just as much. Neither group liked each other. Both groups wanted them to be gone. Both groups wished ill upon the other. And by the time we get to the New Testament, the Jews in Jerusalem, if they were traveling from Jerusalem to the northern region of Galilee, which was also a Jewish region, they would go around Samaria. They would cross the Jordan River and travel up on the eastern side towards the desert rather than walk straight through the region of Samaria. So you get to John chapter 4, and Jesus famously goes to speak to a woman of Samaria at a well, and we get this statement from John. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, asked for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Later on in John, after Jesus delivers a a strong word to the people, they respond with what they see to be the harshest possible insult they could muster. And so they look at Jesus and they say this in John 8. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? That's the way they thought about Jesus. That was the, the working relationship that was at play here. If we were to paint it in a modern example, you don't have to go far from modern Israel to see it in the relationship between Israel and Hamas. That's about the tension that Jews and Samaritans had between each other. So when Jesus says that a Samaritan shows up, you can almost hear the groans of disdain in the people who are listening. Ugh. I can't stand it. Yet Jesus masterfully paints the Samaritan as the hero of the story. How messed up is that? This Samaritan is recorded for us as the good Samaritan because he displays powerfully what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. This man is on his journey 
riding his own beast of burden, likely a donkey. He sees a man in need and is moved with compassion. And whereas the others went across on the other side to go around the man in need, this text tells us this man went to him. He's moved with compassion. And it leads to action. He immediately starts first aid, medical treatments on his wounds. He picks up the man and places him on his own ride. Now he's walking. And the wounded man is riding. Takes him to the nearest inn. Checks him into a room there and continues to care for his medical needs and to to nourish him throughout the night. Because the text says the next day he talks to the innkeeper and gives him two denarii. A denarii is a full day's wage. And some archaeologists have have done some digging and found the the estimated amount that this would have covered, the stay, it would have covered been about two months for this man to recover in that end. And upon this, he also leaves him an open cab. Did you see that? I'm going. I I gotta finish my journey. Care for him. If you spend anything else, write it down. I'll be back and I'll take care of it. This Samaritan doesn't even know the man's name. It's not like he's found a long-lost cousin on the side of the street. It's like, oh, let me help you. It's not as though he's coming because he called him for help. He found a random stranger, almost dead, picks him up and nurses him back to health. In fact, if the wounded man were awake, he likely would have spat in the face of the Samaritan for coming that close and daring to touch him. But the Samaritan's good neighboring shines through majestically. And in Jesus' story, we see the characteristics of what it means to be a good neighbor. It's leaping off the page. To be a good neighbor means compassion towards others in need. Not just an emotional feeling, good neighboring leads to actions for the good of others. We also see that being a good neighbor doesn't happen on a planned schedule. This guy was not traveling down this road thinking, I'm going to be the rescue squad today. It's not the way it worked out. It messed up his plan. It was an inconvenience to his time. Being a good neighbor also demands your resources to meet the needs of the people around you. There's also an aspect of long-term commitment. He sees him all the way through his problems, all the way through to the other side of his struggle, caring for his provisions. And and in the context, remember, the lawyer to whom Jesus is dialoguing asks the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus' answer is not about defining who. It's asking the question, are you a good neighbor? It's not about who is your neighbor. It's a question, are you being a good neighbor? Because he says this in verse 36. He changes it. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? Christian, you are called to good neighboring toward whoever happens to be in your sphere. What is Jesus' main point in sharing this story? It's a powerful story. It's an amazing illustration. It's an amazing parable. But as I I mentioned, this is a very well-known story, but I think it's often one of the most misunderstood stories in the Bible. Because Jesus' point for telling it is a little different. If you trace back in history, you can find all kinds of different uh, ideas for how people interpreted the story. Go back to the ancient church fathers. A lot of them saw it as an allegory. An allegory. In other words, it paints a picture, and they would see it as a picture from all of redemption, from creation to new creation and redemption. It's all painted in this story of the Good Samaritan. You'll find many, both in ancient and modern days, who allegorize the story to fit their specific theological bent who use it to paint a story and to be, to, to be a, a, a gotcha text for, for what they want to push. 
some social agenda, or some theological point. Even the lost world appeals to this story in a variety of ways. People who aren't even Christians will appeal to the story of the Good Samaritan. But we must seek to understand it for what the text tells us. For why it's recorded here to begin with. Look back at verse 25. The interaction begins here. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that's Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This lawyer is an expert in the law. The law of Moses. That's the law they're referring to. The first five books. He could quote it front to back. He could knew he knew the citations. In fact, we'll read here in just a minute. When Jesus asked him what's the most important, he gets it right. Other places, Jesus is the one who gives that answer. This guy gets it right. Did you notice his question? He comes to test to test Jesus, which that's a whole other side. It's we, we don't test God, God tests us. Anyhow. But he comes and he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Have we ever heard that question before? If you read your New Testament, you know it shows up a couple different times. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. A teacher, a ruler of the Jews comes to Jesus by night and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler comes with the same question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is having a conversation with someone about eternal salvation when he shares the story. So how does it go? Where does Jesus point this person to, this expert in the law? Well, first we look at verse 26 to 28. He turns the question around on him. He says, Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and live. The guy gets it right. The guy answers understanding what Jesus has been pushing for a while in his teaching. Maybe he heard Jesus respond that way to another conversation. But Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew tells us that upon these two commands hangs all the law and the prophets. So the guy summarizes the Old Testament rightly. And Jesus commends him for it, and then he says, do this and live. Does that strike you as strange? Do this and live. Do this and live. Jesus is telling somebody to go do something. Uh, We're we're here at Gospel Life Church. Good news. We, we, We believe the good news of salvation is by grace through faith alone, not of works. So why is Jesus telling somebody to go do something? Well, Jesus is not saying anything false. But Jesus knows that the law has come in to point us to our need for a Savior. The law was given to show us that we can't make it to God on our own. Jesus is not saying anything wrong. In other words, he's turning to this guy and saying, Mr. Law Expert, If you can perfectly love God with everything you are and perfectly love your neighbor as yourself, you're all set. But here's the thing. He can't. I can't. You can't. No one can. This man knows what is required to please God according to the law, but mere knowledge of the standard does not equate to keeping the standard. We get more to the heart of the matter in verse 29. I found verse 29 almost like whiplash in the conversation. Jesus says, do this and live, verse 29, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Never mind the fact 
that he evidently has got loving God with his heart, soul, mind, and strength all down pat. But I think really what's going on is this man understands that loving God is not necessarily seen externally. You can't see what my heart loves. You can't necessarily see what I'm thinking. But you can see how I love my neighbor. And so in his own efforts to justify himself, He's trying to take this whole idea of who is my neighbor and bring that down to a manageable size where I can rationalize it and justify it for myself so that hopefully I can love at least this little sliver enough so that I can be happy that I'm fulfilling the law. But Jesus... Drops this story upon the man. Before we think this man's question is completely ridiculous, we have to realize that we too are easily tempted with this. We, we operate in these neighbor, non neighbor categories all the time. I, if I can rationalize the bracket of who my neighbor is, then uh, th then hopefully I can show love there, and then, then my non-neighbors, I, I don't have to think about them. We're all tempted to categorize people into neighbor and non-neighbor categories. The people I like, well, they're my neighbors. The people I don't like, well, they're not my neighbors. The people who live in our region, they, they, they might be my neighbors. The people who live in that other place over there, they're, they're not my neighbors. The people who look like me and talk like me, as opposed to those who don't look like me and talk like me. The people who share a similar belief system or a similar set of values, those are my neighbors. But those who believe other things, they, they can't be my neighbors. The people who vote like me or root for the same team that I do, they... They're my neighbors, but those people who vote on the other side or, or root on the other side, they, they can't be my neighbors. And then Jesus comes with a story. He answered Nicodemus in John chapter 3 saying, you must be born again. He answered the rich young ruler saying, sell everything you've got and come follow me. And he answers this expert in the law saying let me tell you a story about what it looks like and what it means to be a good neighbor Jesus drops the anvil of God's law upon this man's heart and mind Showing that he needs a savior. Hear the end of the passage again, verses 36 and 37. Jesus turns the, the, the story and says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And this man who is so self righteous, so self justified, says, The one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do he could not even muster the strength to say the word Samaritan out of his mouth. The one who showed mercy. Much less Jesus turned and pointing to him and saying, go act like the Samaritan in my story. We're not that merciful. We're not that good. You might perhaps love this way towards your family. And I know not all families even love this way. But this parable is an indictment of our sins of omission, the things we omit from our lives that we as people who love God are compelled to do. 
Jesus answers this legal expert's self-righteousness by dropping the weight of God's law upon his loveless heart. And similarly, similarly, this parable should land upon each of us with the weight of how shallow and weak our love of neighbor actually is. For no one loves like this. None of us love like this. Jesus loves like this. You see, that's the point. The point is that we can't love like this. Loving strangers perfectly, fully, completely, always. We can't love like that. We, we, we don't do that well. But Jesus loved like this. Jesus is the one who came our neighbor because he took on flesh like ours he took on full humanity upon himself he became like us so that he might live the perfect life that we couldn't live and die the death that you and I deserve Jesus came and took your sin upon the cross the scripture says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that you might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus loves even better than the good Samaritan because he came to you when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And he died so that you might be resurrected again. If you are not a Christian, you cannot perform well enough to meet God's perfect standard. You cannot love well enough in your own strength to make God say, okay, we'll let you in. But Jesus came and died and rose again, taking your sin debt and offering you the free gift of his eternal life. If you will turn and trust in Jesus, you will be saved. Stop trying to justify yourself before God. We're really good at trying to rationalize our own shortcomings away. But God sees it plain. Do not justify yourself before God, but turn and trust in Jesus. Christian brother, Christian sister, it is only when you are living in the love of Jesus that you can know what true love actually is. We love him because he first loved us. And we can love the people around us because he first loved us. We can love others with sacrificial joy because we know what love is. We can embrace inconvenience and personal expense for the sake of others because Christ loved us first. We can love those who aren't like us, sacrificially going to those who don't even like us so that they will know the message of salvation and so that all nations might come and worship Jesus. It's only when you know the amazing grace and love of God that you can turn and Love your neighbor as yourself. Our world is well acquainted with the idea of a good Samaritan. So sadly, they miss the point of why Jesus was sharing with them. This parable from Jesus tells us that good neighboring is not about who is my neighbor, but rather, am I being a good neighbor? For his point is the fact that you can't be. None of us are that good. Jesus is the good neighbor. He's the perfect neighbor. He's the one who's come near and shown love so that you might be rescued. He is the perfect one. And if you turn and trust in him today, you can be saved. Christian, it is only by knowing the love of God, by experiencing what it is to be loved by Christ, that you can in turn 
love your neighbor right now. So let us be a people in whom the love of Christ dwells so richly that it overflows in love to those around us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your scripture. Lord, thank you for the hope that Jesus gives. Father, I pray that you would apply your word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see that we might love like Jesus loves. And for those that do not know the love of Christ, Father, would you move in them now and draw them to yourself. Father, be magnified as we trust you together in this time. In Jesus' name.